get my six. What's up everybody? <laughs> Today's video is about timing, potentially Bigfoot Sasquatch. Got a heck of a story for you. And hopefully my magic trick. I'm going to tell you about my magic trick because I might pull it off at any time and you need to be watching to see if it happens, okay? We're in a drought here in Virginia. Throughout much of the entire country right now, we're in a drought. Uh, yesterday, my beautiful bride, Dearly, aka Giggly Girl, and myself and our wonderful son, Daniel, went hiking, one of our favorite hiking spots. It's up along a stream. You get towards the top of the mountain and there's a very deep swimming hole. It's, the river was dry. I mean, there was one hole where there was still enough water to get wet, but as we continue going up, there was just less and less. So we desperately need rain. So it's calling for rain today. Something like 60% chance of thunder and lightning storms between two and like four or five p.m. And right now, as I'm making this video, it's almost five. And it hasn't rained a drop. And so I remembered about how there's some really weird things that happen here on this property, especially here, especially if I can tell a really cool story and the whatevers that be around here, uh, I believe they're impasse as they become riled empathically. Sometimes it just starts raining and we need the rain. So I'm hoping this story can also be a magic trick. And the timing is this, uh, a lot of folks have been asking when, oh when, please, please, oh when, will you have Bigfoot Sasquatch Files 11 ready, available? I, I read the first 10. I'm just chomping at the bit to read 11. When's it coming? Well, the good news is uh, I had some time to work on it today after I addressed all 50 uh, manila envelopes I'm sending out the autographed print copies of uh, the Lunatic in from you, you guys bought them out in one day they were i was actually waiting on them to arrive today so I, was, I got that finished so then i start writing you know working on uh bigfoot sasquatch files 11 and here's what happened just have a look good news bad news i'm attempting to work on bigfoot sasquatch files volume 11 which is already underway Bad news is I keep getting distracted with my view. Got my pond, my fruit orchard, and my little fruit thieves. They sure do like those peaches. They like to get full and then lay over there and take a nap. Where was I? So I got distracted with that. Um, I just, it's so hard to work from that angle in that room and have that view outside. And, and, and I'm particularly proud of that view because when we bought the place, that was just a field. There was nothing there. And it being that it's the low point of our property, when it rains, it would get all soggy and mushy and mucky. So, uh, I think our second winter here, I said, you know, that's a perfect place for a fruit orchard. Build a privacy hedge all the way around to block the view of the road down there, which we'd already started. But then just plant trees here, which we did. They were all like this tall when we got them three years ago, I think. And now some of them, now those peach trees the, deers were eating, the deer were eating from, we actually planted our first year here. So, uh, they man, they've got like baseball size peaches all over them. And, and, but some of the pear trees already have fruit. It's wonderful. So that's, that's my view. So I thought, well, uh, it's a, it's a thing about timing. These deer just happen to show up when I'm finished addressing these envelopes. I'm trying to write. So they distracted me for like the longest time. Then they finally left. They got up and they left. And I thought, oh, okay. Now I can write. I can work on Bigfoot Sasquatch Files Volume 11 and get back to it, you know? And then I got an email notification that, the 50 copies of the lunatic that you guys bought in one day had been delivered to my gate.
You know, yesterday's video, I kept hearing like a growl or something like that in the woods back there. And one lady commented, I pinned it on the video from yesterday. She has a dog, some kind of like mountain something. I don't know, mountain, some kind of dog. It walked through the room when I was hearing things and it stopped with its ears perked up and watched her TV screen. And then it just kept watching. It sat on the couch and watched the rest of the video. And I don't think that dog was watching to listen to me. So there are dogs seeing things in these videos that some humans can, but most can't, and hearing things that some humans can and most can't. So keep your eyes on the background back here. So anyway, I went and got the book, so now I'm autographing them my hands, my, my hand, my right hand is cramping because I'm right-handed from all the autographs and all that, and all the labeling of the stuff. But I'm gonna tell you, I'm not gonna be specific here. Uh, I better get tough because at the end of this month, around the end of August, going to be doing a lot of autographing and mailing and you're going to be very excited about what's coming i'm not going to say anything about it specifically until it's here it has to do with bigfoot sasquatch files um and it has nothing to do with bigfoot sasquatch files volume 11 but don't let that get your hopes down that's coming okay so just hang in there now with all this said it's bigfoot sasquatch story time so yesterday I was talking about how I had recently reconnected with my longest childhood friend. Uh, we might get some rain. Sounds like someone or something is sneaking in to listen back here. Hope I can get them emotionally riled. Maybe they can do some weird things to have it rain around here. We sure do need the water. So anyway, I told a story about um, how it was unfortunate when we were kids. We had a, a, a friend of ours uh, died mysteriously, unexpectedly in the woods uh, when he was going up to do some native brook trout fishing in some beaver dams. Something very odd happened. You'll have to go back and watch the video from yesterday because I, I don't want to retell it here. Uh, I didn't even remember this event. I remember the passing of that that young boy, he was 12, I think. And I remember going into the woods to try to find this thing that he, he saw that he should not have seen as the local conspiracy theorist explained to us. And we, according to my friend, uh, a repressed, something I've repressed that I can't remember, we potentially saw something that we maybe shouldn't have seen. And he said that's why he was not surprised that I tell a lot of these stories up here about Bigfoot Sasquatch on this channel. Even though that's not what this channel's about. Everybody knows that. I mean, I talk about this sometimes. And we go looking for him, her, it, or they sometimes. It's daytime sometimes. It's nighttime sometimes. But it's only sometimes. Always. We do other stuff too. So anyway, I was thinking about this today, and I was thinking, why did I know exactly where that kid was going? And the answer was because I'd spent quite a bit of time native brook trout fishing in those beaver ponds as well. And I remembered two oddities about this area, okay, on top of this mountain. And I'm going to talk to you about these two oddities. They... They happened two different times, and this would have been 35, 32 to 35 years ago, okay? Uh, to get to these beaver ponds, you had to hike straight up a mountain in Appalachistan. Somebody asked in the comments, where is that? Appalachistan is a semi-autonomous region that covers uh, West Virginia, Kentucky, much of Tennessee, the southwestern portion of Virginia. We don't wanna leave them out. I forgot to mention that part, because you get south of Roanoke and you're in Appalachia, north of Roanoke, you're, you're not. It's like mid-Atlantic, uh, southern type culture. Different, but that south of Roanoke, it's, it's Appalachian culture. Um, so I refer to the entire semi-autonomous, at least culturally, certainly, uh, economically uh, and uh, accidentally the way folks talk. That's Appalachistan. 
Um, I lived overseas many years, Middle East, Asia, and regions got named for based upon the culture, not based upon territorial lines or state lines or stuff like that. So, uh, but my portion of Appalachistan was West by God, Virginia, not to be confused with Western Virginia. Uh, they're two different states, Virginia and West Virginia. Okay. So the mountains there are very steep. Now, when I lived out West in Washington state, people would laugh when I referred to anything back home as the mountains, like the Blue Ridge Mountains or the Appalachian Mountains. And I had to give it to them because we lived uh, below the Cascades there, just south of Seattle. And, and I would go up into those mountains and man, what a difference. And of course you have to cross the Rocky Mountains to get out there, driven through those. Uh, I remember going through Colorado and getting a headache from the elevation. I remember getting out of the truck in Utah to walk out into the beautiful desert. And, and I remember after going maybe 30 or 40 paces, feeling I was breathing so hard as if I just run some wind sprints. And it was because of the elevation, the oxygen was so much thinner there. And I was in shape at the time, by the way. I mean, there's been, there hadn't been a whole lot of times in my adult life I've been out of shape. Um, so, the, but they're very steep. And I would always tell my friends out West, okay, they might not be as big and, and foreboding as these West Coast mountains or, 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 you know, middle America mountains. But you go out there and walk up and down them all day long and see if you can even move the next day. And I'll tell you, when I first moved to Virginia 20 some years ago, and then if, if I would go back and hike in those mountains or go hunting, I could hardly move the next day. And I was fit. I was in shape. I was running road races, 5Ks and 10Ks, still running 5Ks and like, 17 minutes and 10 K's in like 37 minutes. Not, you know, my best, but I was in my late twenties by then. And, uh, those hills still took it to me. So here are the two oddities. You had, you had to walk straight up those mountains for about an hour and a half to get to this place. Um, and it was an area where there were just a, a couple mountain streams that the beavers had dam dammed up and created into ponds. Uh, full of brook trout, full of brook trout. So one time I was up there and I was not fishing. I was just up there hiking. It might be when I discovered the ponds. I don't know. But the ponds sit in this bowl, like in this flat bowl on top of the mountain. And then the elevation goes up on both sides there. And then you start going down the, the, the sides different sides of the mountain. It was almost like a, a caldera in a volcano, but it had, had these ponds in them. So I was up there one time looking at the ponds. I hadn't fished in them yet because I kept remembering. I remember I kept saying, man, I got to come fishing up here. I bet you these things are full of brook trout. And every now and then I'd see some dart up underneath the banks and whatnot. So I decided to take a shortcut back, which involved going up out of the caldera, so to say, to the high point and dropping straight down over the other side of the hill. Well, I remember finding a series of uh, not so much caves. There's a lot of limestone in certain parts of Appalachia, and there was in that part. And so uh, they were just, you know, limestone will dissolve. Now, it takes uh, millions of years, but if there's a water source running into like a limestone deposit, it will eat out caves, big sinkholes for, for is probably a more appropriate term. These things were everywhere from where the water was running off of the top of that, that highland there, th that highland that it, it, the water formed these small streams that became these beaver ponds. And I started messing around and going inside some of these things. And I didn't have a light with me cause it was daylight. I, I didn't take, I've been known to go into the middle of the woods to look for him, her, it, or they, and not even take a flashlight with me and sometimes get stuck. But viewer Bill Purr, Bill Poole up in Pittsburgh sent me the most awesome flashlight I've ever had in my life. It's fully charged. And Bill, thank you again for that flashlight. And a night hunt with that flashlight is coming. Just bear with me. Give me a little bit of time. Oh, that's a plane. I thought him, her, it, or they started growling at the, the idea of a night hunt. Hey, it's a night search. We don't kill them. We don't intend any harm upon them. We just go looking for them. Try to see if we can see them. Okay, so anyway, 
I would crawl into these sinkholes, these caves, as it were, as far as I could while still being able to see. And you get into there, and a lot of them had not been affected by water for many, many years because of erosion and the way the streams, the, the flow of the stream would change and shift as the land changed and shift, shifted. So you get that light silt. You know, there would be some leaves that had blown up in there maybe 10 years ago. They're still there. They're not, they're not uh, um, biodegrading uh, all the way because they're not getting sunlight. They're not getting moisture. They're like, you touch them and they like pff, turn to dust. You guys have, and girls have probably been in places like this, spending time in the woods. Well, I, I distinctly remember going up into one of these and going to the point to where it was dark i couldn't see and i wanted to keep going but i was kind of scared because i was like 13 or 14 and i remember putting my hand up in there and drawing it back really quick because i felt fur and i thought i'd touched an animal but nothing came charging out at me so i put my hand back up in there again and i grabbed some of this fur and i pulled it out it was brown and i assumed it was deer fur or maybe beaver from the ponds but I couldn't figure out why it would be in this cave. Number one, if it was a beaver, why would the beaver be staying in a cave instead of its hut? And number two, deer typically don't go in caves. I mean, I've never seen a deer in a cave before in my life. So I'm now questioning, especially after the story that my friend told me yesterday that I can't remember, if that was really, uh, what, what kind of hair exactly was that, okay? Number two, I went up to this place probably the following summer. So I would have been about 13 or 14, uh, 15 at the most, but I don't think I was that old. I think I was 13 or 14 and I went up there to fish. And this, this kid that, that passed on, he was a couple years younger than, than us. So this sounds about right. This was probably either the summer that he went up there and, and, and was later unfortunately found dead or the summer after or the summer before. But I remember fishing. I started at the bottom of the pond. Those of you who fish for trout know, you know, fish face upstream because it takes less energy for them to breathe. They just kind of tread water and the oxygen flows just right through their gills. So you've got to come up from behind them. You got to fish from downstream. You got to stalk these suckers. You got to, you can't make any noise. You got to walk lightly because they can feel the vibrations on the ground. These are wild fish and they're very sensitive. If the wind gusts and there's a limb over the hole of water they're in and, the, and the, the wind blows the limb like that, that's enough to scare them and they'll go up underneath the bank and they won't come out for hours. So I remember being at the lower portion of these beaver ponds, creeping up there as much as I could. And the main beaver hut was up at that, like the head of the pond. They dammed it up several different places because it was several streams, but there was this huge hut up at the end. And I'd seen it before. The previous year when I was up there and I found the sinkholes. That's wind. I was sure, sure was hoping that was rain. We sure do need it. So I'm creeping up this stream, fishing, and I look up at this big hut and I notice it looks like there's a secondary mound beside it, like a smaller hut. And I hadn't remembered seeing this before, but I was still a couple hundred yards away. So I'd fish and I was getting closer and I was sneaking and I was catching some. And, uh, I got closer and I looked up and it looked like this secondary hut that was a little bit smaller had moved and it was coming closer to me. So I started looking at it real close. It was probably 150 yards, 100 yards away by now. I thought, well, that just must be like a secondary hut that I haven't noticed. Maybe I couldn't see it from the angle where I was before. So I keep going up, I'm sneaking, I keep fishing upstream, and then I hear like water moving, like something was swimming in the water. And I look up again, that big hut is still way up there, but that what appeared to be a secondary hump, just a brown mound in the water had made its, uh, had made its way so close to me, I should have been seeing individual sticks, ind individual branches that the beavers would have put together to form this hut but I wasn't. It didn't look like it was made of sticks. It looked just like round and brown and made of like one uh, something, whatever it was, like fur. But it was still not quite close enough to where I could have, I mean, I couldn't see a face, couldn't see any of these things, but I did notice that there was water rippling out from the sides of it like this. There was no wind, there was, nothing so that indicated to me that whatever that was was moving towards me and 
I don't remember ever at any time thinking, oh my God, that's a Bigfoot Sasquatch. Or, you know, that's a woolly mammoth, you know, long lost from the Ice Age. I just, I didn't know what it was, so I know I very quietly and meticulously started making my way back downstream. There was another creek that wove around this way. These beaver ponds are very interesting places. If you've, if you've never seen one, just find a video on YouTube and watch it. They're really neat. So I started fishing downstream, even though I knew it was wrong. The trout will see you coming. And I had forgotten. I mean, I had no... I had not thought about these things since talking to my buddy there just a couple days ago now. And since thinking more about the story he told me and then telling that story here on YouTube yesterday, it's like when you, somebody mentioned in a comment here recently, something about the importance of just talking. I think it's something I said in a video about veterans, you know, uh, the reason a lot of times veterans don't, veterans do talk about, you know, what happened over there or in, during their time of service. They just don't talk about it with you if you're one of those people that as soon as they start talking about, they say, oh, this one time when I was in Iraq, you're like, where exactly were you? What was your unit? What was your job there? And I had somebody do this to me recently, and I'm like, what? And they said, we have family members who served, and we just want to make sure that everybody else who claims to have served is telling the truth. Well, immediately I knew I'm not telling these people what I was going to tell them. I mean, they're accusing me of false or stolen valor, being a liar. Just because so what I was saying in the video was, or, uh, I was talking about the importance of talking about stuff. It, you just need to have somebody, it's not going to be everybody, as you can tell with the way these people reacted that I just described. But if you have a friend, uh, a fellow veteran is always is great. That's your number one best bet, I think. But if you have someone, like I talked to my friend that was here the other day about some stuff that happened in Iraq and the Philippines that I've never talked to anybody about, never put in any books. Because he, even though he wasn't there and he's not a veteran, he uh, is, is very non-judgmental. He didn't tell me how I should have done things differently. He never accused me of lying about it. And that's something that for many years I never understood, this whole concept of if somebody would be lying about their military service, because I thought, who would do that? And then I actually met somebody that did that. And those of you, the 50 people that's getting ready to get a copy of The Lunatic, you're going to be reading about a pretty much identical situation of, of my experience. Uh, because this character is based on a persona of several people who need some help that aren't getting it. But I met a guy who, who anytime I mentioned, if I mentioned, you know, the Army or if I mentioned Iraq, uh, he would talk about, yeah, when I was in the Navy, this, when I was in the Navy, that. For months after I first got to know him, and, and so I thanked him for his service. Thank you for your service and uh, all this stuff. And then one day, I just asked him out of curiosity because it, it, I remembered that because I, I knew a guy in the Navy, and, and they did basic training on um, one of the Great Lakes, Lake Superior, I think. And so I asked this guy. I said, "Hey, I'm just curious because I heard winters out there are nasty in the Great Lakes region." When you did your basic training with the Navy, were you out there during one of those nasty winters or did you have the, the, the benefit of being there in the summer? And he says, well, I, I never went to basic training. And I'm like, how's that work? You just went straight from ROTC in college to being an officer and you got to skip it? Well, no, technically. I mean, and then it's when it, the truth came out. He was never in the Navy. He never served in the United States Armed Forces. He was in ROTC in college and his ROTC instructor was a naval officer, and so therefore he identified as having served in the Navy. And you know what's just as disgusting as that? On more than one occasion when he would be talking about, well, when I was in the Navy this and when I was in the Navy that, his wife was there and said nothing. And they were, they were doing this to a veteran. Now, if you'll lie about that, You'll lie about anything. And so I guess I kind of understand where some of these people come from uh, when they say, well, my uncle was in the military and he never talked about that. Now, that's that's overkill. That's overkill. Uh, but, yeah, I guess there are people out there that will claim stolen valor. What's that have to do with what may or may not have been in that stream that day on top of that mountain up there at those beaver ponds? I don't know. There's some weird stuff out here in this world that um, 
this can't be explained, I don't think. Um, and it makes me wonder, how often do we potentially see and or hear some of these strange things and have no clue that that's what we're looking at? I don't know, but there's your tail for the day. And I gotta get in the house, uh, start signing some books to send out here over the next few days. You guys will hopefully have them all by the end of the week. It looks like my, my magic trick didn't work, but let's keep our fingers crossed because we, we certainly need the rain. See you for more next time from here at Homesteading Off The Grid and whatever in the hell this channel's about. It's hard to tell what even one video is about. It's like about eight different things. Crazy.